Good afternoon and good morning, everyone. This is Jonathan Edelheit, um, Editor-in-Chief of the Corporate Wellness Magazine and President of the Healthcare Reform Center and Policy Institute. Um, today's webinar and webcast will be on navigating wellness communications to avoid legal liability and pitfalls. Um, I'm excited for this presentation and for our co-panelists, um, David Wilson and uh, Edward Shulkin. So today, what we're going to do, you know, give you an overview of today's presentation is we're going to be talking about changes to incentives under PPACA, um, a little bit of how employers are incentivizing employees and using gift cards. We're going to be discussing the different laws that impact uh, corporate wellness programs such as HIPAA, GINA, ADA, ADEA, um, and I think that uh, and PPACA and some you know case studies and recommendations for the future. I think one of uh, you know the most important parts of why this webcast is is kind of critical is that there are a lot of laws that apply to corporate wellness programs. There's a lot of compliance issues. And it's very difficult for the average person who hasn't gone to law school to kind of piece all these together and to figure out how they come together or how it applies to this specific plan. So I'm really excited to have, um, to have this uh, webcast put together where uh, we can go ahead and have David, who's really an expert in corporate wellness and employment law and labor law, to be able to really go through some real life examples and practical situations where we're going to have some polling going on during um, the webinar and to see what your opinion is as the attendee as to whether a certain situations comply or not to give us more of a practical approach to it rather than the, just the law and the theoretical. So I think that, you know, we all know that, well, you know, most employers have incentive programs in place. Um, you know, PPACA uh, has, they move forward the ability for employers to offer incentives. Um, where you can incentivize em uh, employees by 30%. Um, and I know that you know, most employers use it as an incentive and, and as a reward. Some employers um, talk about it as, as more of a penalty or disincentive if, if you don't participate. And David's going to you know, kind of cover his um, in view of it, which is, I think is a great perspective of how employers should approach it from either the incentive or the disincentive side. Um, and then for smoking cessation, they can increase it, uh, you know, the penalty or the reward, however you view it, up to 50%. And obviously, we're seeing a lot of creative ways employers are providing incentives. Some are allowing employees to get merchandise. Some are giving discounts, cash, vacation days. And, you know, a lot are doing gift cards and allowing the employee to choose what they um, would like to use it for. So um, I'd like to thank uh, CDS for, you know, bringing uh, underwriting this webcast. Um, and obviously, for example, in, in CVS situation, CVS gift cards allow employees to buy their medicine um, as an incentive while prohibiting the purchase of things like tobacco products, alcohol, or candy. So it's kind of, you know, making sure it's being taken to the next step of giving an incentive and a gift card, but making sure they're using that gift card in a healthy way, or you can use it for spa services or shopping on Amazon. Um, so I think, you know, the, the neat part about the gift card incentive side of it is, is allowing the employee to choose what, what makes them feel better in, in using it. Um, we're seeing gift cards uh, being used in um, you know, both uh, wellness and non-wellness programs, incentivizing even people for hitting marketing targets or deadlines or just being a good employee or winning a contest. Um, so obviously, a lot, most employers are using gift cards because it's easier to handle than dealing with cash or other type of rewards. It's, it's very easy to do. There's usually sometimes no expiration dates or purchase fees. Um, so with that, we'll get on to the really good stuff. Um, so I'd like to turn it over to David Wilson at Hirsch Roberts and uh, Weinstein. And as I said, is uh, you know David's really an expert, and he brings a really interesting perspective to really looking at corporate wellness programs and the contests and programs that you offer. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, <coughs> A judge told me recently that an expert's just somebody from out of town. So uh, if you're not in Boston, then I'm from out of town for you. Um, so uh, we want to talk um, a little bit about, uh, I think Jonathan knows a lot about how uh, uh, PAPACA, or the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act, uh, affects uh, wellness programs. And I'm going to really focus on the non-PAPACA issues. And so when we look at, at those um, 
at those issues. Let's see. Can we uh, advance the slide? Um, we talk about wellness programs and the um, why are they becoming so popular? Well, everybody is trying to figure out how to address their health care costs. Um, but I think the other piece of it that somehow gets lost in that is that they can be uh, fun, rewarding, uh, and enhance something that in the wellness industry we call presenteeism. And that's uh, not only are you actually at your job, but you have more energy and more focus to be able to uh, do your job. And so um, I think that as, as people realize that there are other benefits to this other than saving health care costs, that's, that's going to be great too. Um, so from an employment lawyer's perspective, there are uh, lots of potential um, traps related to um, wellness programs. Uh, can we, and if we can advance the slide, for some reason I can't do it on my end. Um, and w we talk about the alphabet soup of, uh, of programs, and those um, include um, GINA, ERISA, the ADA, HIPAA, and the ADEA. Uh, ERISA being the um, Employment Retirement Income Security Act. So if you have a, a 401k plan or any kind of retirement plan, you're most likely going to be subject to ERISA. Um, and then the ADEA is the uh, Age Discrimination and Employment Act. Then in 1990, um, there was the Americans with Disability Act was passed. And then um, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act was passed in 1996. And that was primarily focused on, if you remember, there was, I think, a state, uh, a congresswoman uh, from Colorado whose uh, medical records were splashed all over uh, the country. And it was, uh, it was because there were no real controls over that. And so after, after that, um, HIPAA was passed. And then more recently, uh, Gina, um, not my sister Gina, but the uh, Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act uh, was passed. Okay, uh, next slide. Um, and so you can see the history of how these laws have come in to protect um, individuals. And I want to sort of briefly talk about each one and uh, and how um, they affect wellness programs. And then we'll actually go and have some uh, questions, some quiz or polling questions for, uh, for each of you to see uh, where you stand on that. Uh, okay, uh, next slide, please. So um, wellness plans, when it comes to HIPAA, um, HIPAA basically prohibits any uh, ERISA group health plan from discriminating against uh, the employees based on uh, a health factor. And uh, HIPAA defines health factors basically as anything that relates to you and your, your medical history. So it could be, uh, for example, your body mass index, um, the number of times that you've gone to the doctor, uh, the fact that you may have uh, a family history of diabetes, um, things like that. So um, if you see uh, on the list here, it would be uh, other examples. So when implementing a wellness program, you have to be careful um, not to discriminate against individuals based on a health factor. And this can be tricky because um, what one of the things you're trying to do is get a family history, uh, get a history about the individual's um, health plan and decide um, what things that you can improve on. So getting that initial benchmark and, 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 um, and moving forward. So then let's talk about wellness plans with respect to GINA. And GINA uh, is the Genetic uh, in Information Non-Discrimination Act. Next slide, please. And that basically prohibits uh, any kind of discrimination in a wellness program um, based on its acquisition of genetic information. So, for example, in these uh, health uh, history assessments that usually are done at the outside of a wellness program, 
um, Gina, uh, there's an effort to try to collect information that could run afoul of Gina. Um, so for example, if my family had a history of diabetes or um, some other genetic disease, and that was uh, that was uh, discovered uh, and used against me. That would certainly be a violation of GINA. And you know, one of the things that I think Jonathan and I are going to talk about today is a little bit is the difference between mandatory and voluntary programs. If an employer's wellness program seeks um, genetic or family information um, as defined by GINA, then the wellness program must be um, voluntary. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and then um, so uh, one of the things we recommend when running a wellness program is that it's best if you can have third party a third party administrator collecting that information, and then the GINA information collected in the aggregate uh, that's legal. It's not legal when it's uh, collected uh, based on one individual. Uh, next slide, please. Another area that comes up frequently uh, under the ADA relates to, um, and the wellness programs, relates to when you're trying to um, set different standards. Uh, and um, because of a disability, I may not be able to reach uh, those standards. So, uh, next slide. The ADA would limit an employer from asking questions about uh, my health. Um, it would, um, it imposes strict confidentiality on the disclosure of medical information about me and um, it, it would apply with respect to the essential functions of uh, my job. And we, we have some examples that we're going to talk about a little bit that are going to relate to um, wellness programs and the ADA. So, for example, if uh, because of my disability I was unable to achieve a certain health factor, like because of my disability I uh, couldn't reach the body mass index standard. And you may recall uh, if you have overweight employees uh, at your company, there's even, uh, uh, once they reach a, a, a certain gross weight um, a, over uh, a certain amount, um, then they are determined under the law to be more morbidly obese and therefore protected under the ADA. No pun intended there on the gross amount. Um, Finally, uh, let's look at wellness plans with, with respect to age considerations. Uh, next slide. So for example, if you have a mandatory program that requires an employee to achieve a certain health standard, you have to take into account and adjust for their age. So if you were giving, um, for example, uh, incentives, uh, you were giving away um, gift cards, if em employees could do at least uh, 50 push-ups, um, you might then reduce that standard to uh, a, a different amount um, based on both gender and, and or based on age. Um, this, this baby in this picture actually can do 50 push-ups. Um, and finally, if you, uh, let's look at uh, the next slide, and that has to do with um, that there are a growing number of states that are protecting individuals based on what we call uh, lifestyle discrimination laws. So, for example, there are many states that look at your off-duty conduct and say, employer, you cannot discriminate against somebody based on their off-duty conduct. And where this comes up uh, a lot is with respect to smokers. Um, so, for example, right now, not hiring smokers is is legal, is allowed in 21 states, and it is not allowed, it would be illegal, in 29 states. Uh, there are 34 states that have lifestyle discrimination laws that uh, would protect you. So, and I've had this come up, for example, where 
an employer gave an incentive um, to all its employees if they were non-smokers. And the incentive uh, amounted to um, $50 a month or $600 a year. And the reason it came to my attention was the HR department called and said that somebody had reported that they were at a restaurant that was about 80 miles from the company headquarters and they bumped into another employee who was there smoking and uh, they were calling because they thought that person had uh, signed an affidavit as a non-smoker and they were basically ratting them out and so the HR person wanted to know uh, what what they were supposed to do with that information and uh, so uh, you know that's a that's a situation where you have to first decide okay well what state are you in so for example if you're, you're in New Jersey you could not uh, actually penalize them uh, for that and in a lot of these states you have to offer some alternative so what we might do is say either you're a non-smoker or if you are a smoker we'd ask you to you'd have to participate in a um, smoking cessation type uh, program. So you can see how this alphabet soup of laws uh, creates um, different, different problems for employers. Next I want to turn to a case study and, uh, and this has to do with um, the presentation and communication of uh, wellness programs. And if we go to our next slide we'll look at ABC Corp. And ABC, they had a new policy requiring uh, its employees. And this, this is all information we took about ABC right off the Internet. I'm not telling you it's true, but um, when perception becomes reality, this is exactly what was being said about ABC Corp. So ABC's new policy requiring its employees to submit detailed health profiles to their insurance companies or pay a monthly fine uh, to continue receiving health coverage. Specifically, all these employees must submit their weight, body fat levels, blood glucose levels, and other vital statistics before May 1, 2014, or face a monthly fine, $50 or $600 per year. So this is what was being portrayed, how this, this uh, wellness program was being portrayed. And if that were true, there were a lot of um, potential illegalities in that. Some of the reactions to this plan um, and I, I took these right from Twitter. Uh, your new health policy is now influencing my thoughts on where to do my shopping. Awful thing you're doing. I bet HIPAA is violated and this will be found to be illegal. And then we go on to a, a Facebook posting by somebody and they say shaming people and taking their earned income away because they don't want to partake in a program uh, you're acquiring is demeaning, strips them of their right to privacy, and then goes on and talks about the doctors not being therapists. Well, the the irony of all this is this was one of of the great award-winning programs, uh, wellness programs, and um, I'm a little embarrassed that I used this because I didn't realize who our sponsors were today. But if you go to the next slide, it turns out that this is the award-winning program of CVS Caremark. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, you'll see that their wellness program was received the Best uh, Employers uh, Healthy Lifestyle Award by a national business group uh, because they were in fact running one of the state-of-the-art uh, best wellness programs in the, cult in the country. Um, so what's the lesson here? The lesson was, is in, uh, that there are a lot of folks out there that get really upset about these types of programs either because they, uh, they may not qualify for the incentives or they um, privacy is hugely important to them and they don't trust uh, employers um, but uh, I think the lesson here from this is that uh, employers need to be very clear about when they uh, present these programs to their employees is communicating very carefully with them and um, staying on top of any sort of uh, negative information that comes out. And CBS, to their credit, uh, started a blog or continued a blog uh, about their wellness program and they were able to then diffuse a lot of the, uh, the negative information that 
uh, initially came out about their program, and many of the accusations being uh, being false. All right, next we'd like to turn, turn and talk about uh, when you're trying to create a wellness program, should you be using the carrot or the stick? And um, I, I think I, I have uh, strong feelings about this, and, uh, and they're rooted in the law. And that is that basically employers should be giving incentives for uh, participation, right? And so examples would be gift cards, like gift cards from gift card partners, um, discounts on gym memberships, reducing health care premiums. But what you're doing is everybody's at the base line at the same place, and what you're doing is you are giving incentives uh, for people to participate and, and, uh, and sometimes achieve certain levels. But if you're going to require them to achieve certain levels, you, you need to make sure that you're going to uh, adjust them by age, adjust them by disability, uh, and um, be, be careful that you're not um, inadvertently discriminating. All right, so let's, uh, let's see who's been paying attention here. Why don't we go to some polling questions. And um, so polling question number one, true or false, you are within your rights to have a one-mile road race as part of your wellness initiative and require all employees to run. And what we're going to do is we're going to put up uh, a poll, you should be able to see it now, and ask you to uh, pick uh, true or false on this. And uh, the, there, are, there are a couple of key points in this question. One is it's a one mile road race. Um, as part of your wellness initiative, and two is that um, you're making it mandatory. Um, so let's see, in terms of our uh, poll participation, I think we're uh, about done. Let's close the poll, and the answer is false. And boy, we got a smart group here. And the answer is false for a couple of reasons. One is um, that one, it's a one-mile road race, uh, and two is you're making it mandatory. So the fact that it's a one-mile road race, because of my age or my disability, I may not be able to uh, travel one mile. Uh, and two is by making this uh, mandatory, um, you could be uh, in violation of uh, disability discrimination for anybody who, who couldn't um, participate because of either uh, some some uh, accident they had, some, uh, some disability, some health issue. Um, and so what you'd always want to do in these types of situations is offer some alternatives. If you weren't able to participate in the road race, maybe could you swim or could there be some other activity that uh, you could participate in and qualify. And that's the way you'd want to make sure that you um, covered, covered those issues. All right, let's move to polling question number two. All right, you're within your rights to implement a wellness plan that adds a $15 weekly surcharge to those that test positive for nicotine. And let's get right in there on the, on the polling. Okay. All right, we're going to close the poll in about uh, five seconds here. All right, and so the answer is false. And let's see how our, our poll came out. Um, most folks thought it was true. Well, two, two, two out of three thought it was true. Now, I think I'll give you some credit on those that thought it was true. The answer is, I went to three years of law school, that the answer is, it could depend. And it could depend on um, what state you're in. Uh, in many states, they, that uh, the 34 states that have lifestyle discrimination laws, uh, if you were penalizing me for being a smoker, uh, that would, um, you wouldn't be within your rights uh, there. Um, the other issue here, and I don't give you enough information, it, it could be true if you were also offering 
some other alternative. If I was still a smoker and you uh, and and I participated in a uh, smoking cessation program, or uh, then I would also be able to uh, get that incentive. So a little bit of a trick question, um, but uh, I was I was glad to see that um, some folks were thinking about this uh, one way versus the other. Okay, now we're going to get to a little harder question, not just a true false. Let's go to polling question number three. So here's the situation: you you're trying to run a wellness program, you're trying to make it fun. And uh, I don't know if people are familiar with the Tough Mudder, but that is a, uh, uh, a great uh, wellness workout that uh, if you just Google Tough Mudder, you can, you can see it online. But there are a lot of companies now that are having employees participate in these. And I, I actually have a client who gives uh, points uh, for their wellness program, and you can earn points by doing lots of different things, uh, wearing a uh, pedometer, um, walking the stairs at lunch, and one of them is participating in the Tough Mudder. And you see these pictures from the right are uh, folks participating in it. And it's usually about a 12 or 13 mile um, uh, run with 25 different obstacles that you have to uh, achieve. And here you see you might have to carry a log or I'll climb up a muddy piece or there's a place where you have to climb under electrical shocks or jump into the water from 20 feet, things like that. So you, um, you have employees participate in the Tough Mudder and one breaks their arm and the other complains to you because um, they, they're in a wheelchair. So what are your legal concerns? If we go to the next slide, based on these facts, um, and you, you can choose uh, one, all, or none of these, uh, so we go to the poll now and check the box of the ones where you would have legal concerns. All right, the polls are coming in. All right, and remembering that ADEA is the Age Discrimination and Employment Act. Workers' comp would be for uh, on-site injuries. HIPAA would be for medical privacy issues. And the Americans with Disability Act would be. OK, and so um, why don't we close the poll? We've got a very sharp group here. Um, and so if we look at the, uh, the factors in this, the first was that somebody broke their arm. Now the question would be, I broke my arm at the Tough Mudder. That's not really at work, is it? Well, uh, the employee's argument would be, well, it's part of, tied in with the wellness program, and I could get points for participating in it. Uh, and so my argument is, it is work-related. And I think that's a decent argument. So I would say that workers' comp uh, would definitely be one of the issues. Um, two, uh, so that was what, um, what, that was the second highest. The, uh, the third highest was the 86% on the ADA, and I would agree that um, if you look at this Tough Mudder, for example, if I um, have certain disabilities, I'm not going to be able to participate. And under wellness programs, under wellness law, you would need to offer some some uh, alternatives so folks that couldn't participate in the Tough Mudder could earn the same amount of points under your wellness program. Either that or you'd have to have a broad enough array of uh, wellness opportunities uh, to earn points so that nobody could complain that they were, um, that they couldn't achieve those goals because they, for example, couldn't participate in the Tough Mudder. But I also like the people uh, who picked the ADEA. So, I agree. When I, uh, when I put this question together, I was thinking primarily about workers' comp and um, uh, the, AD, the ADA. But I agree that the ADEA, depending on age, you may not be able to participate in the Tough Mudder. You know, 13-mile run with uh, 25 obstacles. Um, 
And so that certainly could be a factor. And again, what you'd want to do is make sure you offered other activities so that uh, older members of your uh, company could still earn points um, without uh, being able to participate in something like the Tough Mudder. And then finally, HIPAA. Yeah, HIPAA could come into play a little bit um, if we're talking about uh, the fact that there were some uh, you know, medical injuries and the like and uh, that there was uh, care for those. So um, well done. Uh, we've, got a, we've got a pretty sharp group. All right, well, let's go to our, our uh, next scenario. And this scenario has to do with... Uh, your, your new CEO, and she, she's good, she's, but she's a drill sergeant. Uh, and she's telling you, the director of HR, that her biggest concern is she wants to implement a mandatory wellness plan. We need to get our employees in shape. And so that means everybody's going to have to participate. And um, that raises a number of legal concerns, and I'm not going to ask everybody to poll. I'm just going to go through what those concerns are. Um, so first is that the incentives must be based on participation only. Um, second is you cannot request genetic or family medical history. Third is you can't make any disability-related inquiries or medical exams. Um, Fourth, you can't require everyone to perform to a certain standard. So you can't say, okay, everybody's got to um, be able to run or walk a mile in 12 minutes or less in order to qualify for this. And then finally, um, if your plan's mandatory, you have to account for each state's lifestyle discrimination laws. For example, uh, in some states, you couldn't penalize me for uh, being a smoker. Uh, and so the thing that you realize about these mandatory wellness programs is, is that, they, uh, that it's a lot harder to administer them because of the law. So now let's talk about our, our recommendations and what, what we'd like to see in terms of your design of a wellness program. And many of you probably have wellness programs, and um, let's see if you can check off all these different uh, recommendations that you're following. First is basically the, the whole focus of your wellness program is to promote good health, uh, disease prevention, uh, making it fun, giving people more energy, and getting them to feel better about themselves. Um, second is Basically, everything should be a carrot and not a stick. Um, we don't want um, penalties. We want gift cards. We want incentives. We want uh, to give our employees things that they can use and moves them above. So, for example, if my monthly premium as an employee for a single is uh, $600, dollars um, then if I'm participating in the plan, um, I should get some incentive. Um, and it could be a, a $50 a month uh, gift card or something like that that would reduce my overall cost as opposed to um, you're going to make the people that don't participate pay $650. Uh, and that would, that would clearly be a penalty. Um, the other uh, thing in terms of this safe harbor of running these is you, you've got to make sure you allow participants to qualify for awards at least annually. Um, and then when it comes to the ADA, you want to accommodate individuals and encourage them to participate. So um, th the key is, is setting up your plan in a way that allows even uh, somebody with a disability to participate as fully as someone uh, who doesn't have a disability, even if it, it's not apples to apples, uh, even if there are other opportunities that they uh, could do. So, um, you know, this is the example that we gave earlier where the wheelchair guy rolls in and he can participate in the Tough Mudder and you're out there uh, championing everybody who did and making them feel, uh, feel left out. 
Um, other recommendations. Uh, basically, avoid setting the wellness programs based on what they call the health factors. So things like reaching a specific weight or body mass index or lowering your cholesterol below a certain amount. Um, because again, those are health factors and under HIPAA uh, they would uh, basing and uh, discriminating based on health factors would be uh, a HIPAA violation. Um, and then of course uh, another factor with respect to HIPAA is you've got to keep all this information confidential. And that's why uh, companies of any size we recommend that you uh, use a third party administrator to handle all that information and actually shield it from you, the employer. And, it, and by doing that, it does, uh, does protect you. And then any information you see would be in the aggregate of um, relating to all your employees. Um, next recommendation, don't have a reward for the wellness program that exceeds 20%. Well, th um, this, this slide now should be updated. I, I meant to update it. It's now 30%, uh, uh, I believe. And uh, Jonathan, that's his area. Uh, and I think it's, it's, go, it's going even higher at that point. And it could be 50% when we're talking about uh, um, nicotine use. And finally, um, you know, the, the story we've learned about one of the best wellness programs in the country is not only do you have to have a good program, but you have to make sure the message, messages for those programs um, gets presented properly and not mischaracterized by uh, folks that uh, don't like those things. So um, it's all about carrots and not sticks. So at this point, um, that's sort of the end of, of my part of the presentation, but I think we're happy to take questions and um, go from there. Thanks, David. Um, before we open up the questions, uh, I'd just like to cover um, uh, two things. We have a very bunch of very, I think, interesting uh, and unique uh, specific situation questions that came in. Is that, um, I, you know, I definitely like to thank CVS and gift card uh, partners for um, sponsoring um, and helping us uh, put this webcast together. Uh, there's a special offer that, that's been made available through them for the Certified um, Corporate Wellness Specialist course um, where anyone who's on the call today will be able to get a discounted price off of going through the course. It's normally $9.95. They can get it for um, $700 by entering the code at the bottom of the screen, uh, which is uh, CVS, CCWS, uh, 0613, um, and just by clicking at the link, and it's an online course that you can go through about uh, 10 hours of education from the national experts, uh, read a, a course book that comes along with it, and then get certified in the designation. Um, or you can actually go through the course at the conference, and uh, one of the things that we're offering, uh, especially to HR professionals uh, on behalf of uh, CVS and gift card partners in partnership with them is HR professionals can apply for a free pass to the Corporate Wellness con uh, Conference um, by going to the link at the bottom of this slide um, and applying and that will give you a complimentary pass uh, to the National Corporate Wellness Conference. Um, and, and with that, uh, I'd like to um, uh, you know, turn it over to Ed for some uh, final questions. So thank you, Dan. I can't see the questions. <laughs> okay. So um, you know before, what? But but before but before we get into that, I want to thank, of course, everybody for their attendance on behalf of our partner, CVS, and particularly to you, Dave. Uh, for acknowledging the work and leadership that CVS has taken in wellness programs and acknowledging the work and leadership and work that they have done to make sure that the perception of their plan is correct in the, in the consumers' and employees' eyes. I, I'm grateful that you uh, use them as a case study. I think it's a valid case study, and I'm certainly grateful that you acknowledge that the plan is indeed a gold standard plan and the company has done whatever is necessary for them to have done in order to make sure that perception is in fact uh, one shared by the public at large. So I thank you for that. Oh sure, well that's why they were such a good example. 
Yeah, great, great. So, so that being said, Dan, I can't see the question. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so do you I'll, want I'll to take it over? Well, yeah, I'll well, take it over. J Jonathan, I have a question for you uh, because I, I don't uh, pretend, pretend to know as much about Papaka as I know you do. How would uh, Papaka affect the use of gift cards, for example, or other types of incentives like gift cards? Uh, you know, I think we're going to see under Papaka, uh, you know, a real growth in the gift card space and incentive space because obviously um, Papaka allows uh, employers to provide incentives to uh, employees, and it actually kind of encourages that. And there's a huge focus on wellness and incentives um, under PPACA. So I think that what we're going to see is there, there's a large portion of employers that still have not implemented the incentives allowed under PPACA. And, you know, they're just starting to look at how they're going to have to change their plans to comply with PPACA. And I think what we're going to see along with that is they're going to be analyzing what are things that we can do creatively that PPACA allows. Um, so what we're seeing is, is we're seeing a trend of as employers move into that space um, to, and, and looking at the change to their plans, they're, they're implementing the incentives. And obviously I think you know, we're going to see gift cards be a huge area of growth simply from the fact that when they go to implement incentives, they don't have to think about what incentives do we provide. You know, do we give them a vacation? Do we give them merchandise? Do we give them a day off? Um, the gift cards are the simplest thing that, you know, people can use it for whatever they want. Good. So, Dave, I'm going to throw a question, interesting question back at you um, that one of our uh, attendees has asked, um, Baxter, is does a simple family history form, which all doctors use, violate GINA? Oh, good. that's a good question. Well, so let's think about that. So GINA prohibits, you know, the discrimination on the basis of ge genetic information, and it also prohibits the acquisition of that. But it, so I think it would depend if it's a voluntary wellness program. Um, the employer may request genetic information, um, so long as the offering of the genetic information is really voluntary, and the employer is not um, offering uh, a financial incentive for the employee to provide that information. So. Um, but a mandatory wellness program would not be allowed to request the genetic information. So, um, and genetic information under the GINA and the EEOC regulations is, is pretty broadly defined. So, if an employer's wellness program requests family medical history or other genetic information as defined by GINA, one, the wellness program has to be uh, voluntary, and two, the information collected um, during that uh, uh, permissible um, inquiry has to be maintained separately and kept uh, confidential. So I hope that answers your question. Thanks, David. Another question uh, that came in was the AMA just came out and gave their opinion that obesity is a disease. So Jamie asked, does HIPAA also consider obesity a medical condition? Yes, well HIPAA considers body mass index to be a health factor and so if you're going to discriminate based on a health factor, that being your body mass index, that uh, could be uh, or would be a violation of HIPAA, uh, again, uh, unless you uh, fall into certain you know, safe harbors and you create incentives for people as opposed to penalizing them because of their body mass index. Great. Um, another question somebody asked is if they have employees sign a waiver, if they uh, hold harmless agreement, if they participate in any kind of activity, whether it's stair climbing, you know, the mutter contest, you know, does that eliminate the employer's liability or take care of the workers' comp issues? Um, it, it, it could. I think the issue, the, the tricky part about it is if you were tying your wellness program to points and you earn points through participation in those types of events, it's a little bit hard to argue that um, those are, um, you know, not work-related. Um, but in all those waivers, I like to have the words that I am participating, uh, I am voluntarily participating in this event as opposed to making it clear that it's not a mandatory participation. And so that, uh, in it, if you're running a, uh, a situation where it's not 
part of a wellness program, uh, that would probably save you. But once you link it to the program, I think you're going to have an uphill argument that it's not uh, somehow work-related. Okay. Uh, I have another question from Denise. And she has asked, you know, for a self-funded health plan with employees in multiple states where the smoking surcharge is part of the benefit structure, not the wellness program, does the benefit have to differ based on the state the employee works in, or is it based on the company's headquarters in Bay State? Um, I, unfortunately, I think you're, you're going to be stuck with the state that the employee works in, um, because if I'm in the People's Republic of Massachusetts and you're in Kansas, um, you know, my legislature doesn't really care what, what, uh, that you're headquartered in Kansas. So um, you're going to be, you're going to be stuck with the law of the state where your employee is. Okay. Um, you know, we've had a couple other people that have asked questions regarding the, the use of the word penalty um, and what you presented on. You know, and some of the, some of the questions, you know, people asked were, you know, is, is it a, if you use the term penalty, is that somehow a legal positioning of the wellness incentive under the law, or is there a legal difference between calling it an incentive um, versus a penalty? Uh, that's a great question. And I, I think, you know, a perfect example is um, the way CVS had set up their program. It was all incentive-based, uh, yet they still called it a penalty because if I, if I can't, uh, couldn't make some of those um, grades to qualify for those incentives, then I would consider myself being penalized. But, uh, so I think it, it is important to characterize your, uh, your incentives as exactly that, incentives, and not as penalties. Although, you know, there's always somebody who's going to argue that because they didn't qualify for the incentive that they were somehow penalized. Another interesting question that came up um, was uh, from Anna, and she asked you, Dave, if you could cover a little bit about the taxability of gift cards if employers use that as part of their incentive. Jeez, you know, um, good question. I'm, I'm not. Ed, you may know, uh, you may know that better. I'm not a tax lawyer. Um, so that is a question that comes up very often in our business regardless of whether it's applied to a wellness program or uh, an incentive program of any kind. And typically, it follows the guidelines of uh, casual labor, if you will. So up to $600 is typically not taxable. The IRS ruling is extremely fuzzy on it. Uh, and we have information, if anybody is interested in uh, having us share our information with them, we'd be delighted to do so. Just shoot me an email, and I'll send you our files and, and documentation regarding that. Okay. Um, I, I know we have a lot more questions. I know we won't probably have time... Uh uh, we won't have time to answer them all. So what we'll do is, um, you know, we'll gather the questions and then uh, work with, uh, you know, David and Ed in providing some responses. Um, this presentation will be available um, afterwards. We're going to um, send an email to everybody uh, making available the recording tied to the actual PowerPoint itself um, and, uh, and send it out. And if you have any questions, please let us know. And we can also take this discussion to the um, Corporate Health and Wellness Association LinkedIn group. If you'd like to, we'll send a link out to everyone to post your discussion so we can really get um, some input and some community uh, discussion going with that. So I'd really like to thank uh, David and Ed for participating and uh, CBS uh, and gift card partners supported this webcast. I know there were a lot, there were a lot of specific or unique questions that came in, um, so feel free to email that afterward. And, and before we close out, there's one question that came up, um, Dave, you talked about, you know, like I think 34 states um, in regarding, uh, you know, how laws work. Uh, is there a resource people can go to to see how the different laws are in different states regarding, um, you know, wellness and incentives and other things? Um, I think there's probably a link, and what I'll try to do is find that and put it in our answers that, are, that go out. Okay, great. Thank you.
Um, Thank well, you thanks, all. Dave and Ed. Everyone have a great afternoon. A pleasure to you all. Thank too. you. Thanks, Ed. You're welcome.